God of the morning, God of the bright sunshine, God of the dew on the grass and the cooler temperatures, we give you thanks. God of the dance and God of the song, we rejoice in your joy. We give you thanks. For the very life that is still within us. For the light that shines within each person here. And for that light that gets shared around the community and around the state and around the world. Keep our light shining, O oh God, in such a way that people cannot help but miss. Oh God, we come this morning as your people hoping to become better servants, better servant leaders in your community. Breathe your breath of life into our compassion and our kindness and our willingness to reach out and help others. For we cannot do it without you. Give us a vision for what it means to serve this community in even greater ways. Give us your vision for what it means to be your church inside these walls and outside these walls. And it is through our hope for your vision for us that we pray together the prayer of our tradition. Our Father who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn in your hymnal in the back to page 818. Please join me in this, the responsive reading for our Psalm 98, verses 1 through 5. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for the Lord has done marvelous things. God's right hand and holy arm have gotten the victory. The Lord has declared victory and has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. The Lord has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. <laughs> Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, and with the lyre and the sound of melody. Let us listen for the word of God that comes to us from the Gospel of John this morning. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I invite you to pray for me as I pray for you this morning. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable to you. Oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My first car was a 1966 blue two-door Impala, otherwise known as a tuna boat. My parents bought me that car to do my student teaching in Stillwater. And I would drive with one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas. I was scared to death I was going to run into somebody, so I kept that foot on the, the brake. And as I thought about that, you know, I've kind of spent my whole life, especially with this scripture, with one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. I want to share with you this morning my, my journey through life with this particular scripture. It's not about me, it's about how God transforms us. One of my very first understandings about religion was I had a nanny when I was growing up. She was a, an African-American nanny in Central Texas. And we lived out on a farm. I never knew what day of the week it was. I was five years old. I didn't care. But one morning I was washing my dog clothes and she came in and told me I was going to hell and I was going to burn forever because I was washing my dog clothes on Sunday. We didn't go to church much, <laughs> but when we did, man, they had to drag me in kicking and screaming because if that was what religion was about, I was not interested. I remember going and sitting in the nursery with my brother at the Methodist church, and it was kind of fun, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe, I, can, maybe I can go back. Well, this, this nanny also, I, I heard a voice. I was... It, it, we were out on the, on the farm, and I heard this voice call my name. And I went and asked the nanny if she was calling me, because I heard, Linda, Linda. No. I went back in, I heard it again, and I go back out and I ask her, and she said, no, it's the devil coming after you because you're so mean. <laughs> and I said, well... And she described how he was coming after me and, and whatever. And I said, well, I'll just go hide. She said, oh, no, you can't hide from the devil. He's coming after you. So I remember going in and curling up on my parents' bed and crying because this man with a pitchfork was coming after me, and I was so horrible and so sinful that, you know, I probably wasn't going to make it through the day. So that was my introduction to organized or disorganized religion. So I went to, I remember going to Bible school at my grandmother's house, and that was kind of fun. We got to go to the creek, and we got to go to the big Methodist church in Ada and look at all the stained glass windows, and, you know, we just kind of hung out and had fun. Well, then they invited me to go to Baptist Bible school, and they made me memorize the scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. They told me how sinful I was. And the only way that I was going to get out of that sin, at least there's more than the nanny had to say. I mean, I could get out of that sin and, and, and maybe live through the day if I said I believed in Jesus. And that would, if I said I believed in Jesus, I'd stay out of hell and I could go to heaven. Okay. I really... I, I kind of internalized that. I, I, ex, yeah. I mean, these people. I was a little kid. I at least I liked it better than the devil was coming after me and was gonna no matter where I hid. So I thought, well, at least you know, Jesus offers <laughs> offers a way out of all of that. I wound up in the Methodist church because that's where my grandmother would take me on Sundays in Stonewall, Oklahoma. The church was much smaller than this one. And I remember 
I remember the preacher talking about Jesus, and I remember the preacher telling me that God was my father. And any of you know that I probably wasn't very interested. If God was like my father, I was not interested at all. So I had to really struggle with all of that. But you know what kept me going back was the, the women of that church. They were my grandmother's friends. And when I walked in that door, I knew I was loved unconditionally. Nobody cared to talk about what my sins were or how bad I was or how soon I would be going to hell. They just didn't seem to care. And I remember on the day of my baptism, we, I had gone through confirmation, and I learned that we, this is the only thing I remember from confirmation is that we, we sin through thought, word, and deed. So watch my thoughts because they turn into words, and those turn into deeds. So I've been kind of careful about that. But I remember how happy everybody was the day I was baptized, and they welcomed me, and they were, you know, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe, this, is, maybe this religion stuff isn't so bad after all. And, and then I started going to what we call the MYF Methodist Youth Fellowship. And there I, I made friends there, and they were good people, and we had fun. And the preacher would come out with us every night, and we'd play volleyball. Yeah, we'd study the Bible a little. But I remember it being such a good, positive experience. I remember feeling like I was accepted, and I was loved, and I was cared for. And yes, if I made a mistake, somebody would call me on it and tell me how to do it better next time. Then I uh, wasn't long, the, the gal who was the church pianist moved, and they asked me if I would do it. I tried, <laughs> and, and I stayed with it. So all of this time, I was still struggling with this. God so loved the world that God gave a son. Whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. You know, my foot was on the gas with that all the time. And, and I went to, eventually wound up in seminary, and then I was teaching a youth program at the church in Lawton, Oklahoma. And I told the story. I don't, I don't know if you all know the story about the bridge. It, there was a, this bridge, and we don't have those around here, but I think on the East Coast they do. Uh, there's a crossroads, and the, they only had one bridge, and so they'd turn it when the train was coming this way, they'd, it'd be that way, and so if the train was coming this way, they'd turn the bridge, and the story was the, the mother was pregnant, she sent her son, her, the, the father was the bridge operator, she sends her son to go tell the father that she's pregnant, I mean that she's about to have the baby, and the kid gets on the bridge, and the father looks and sees there's a train coming. One of the kids in that group said, I would never kill my baby for somebody else. Yeah, and again, my foot goes right on the brake with that scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave a begotten son. That God would, would do that on purpose. What kind, of, what kind of parent must God be? I never thought about it in those terms. But yeah, I never had a child. But who would want to sacrifice their child? What kind of a parent would that be? I've really struggled with that. I've also struggled with the idea that God brought Jesus in the world so he could die on the cross and save all the rest of us. And I know some people are there, and different people have different, different beliefs, and none of us have the same belief system. So I don't, you know, this is just my story. This is my journey, and where yours is, I celebrate. And I, I, but I just really had a problem with this. And then I remember that I remembered that God gives us free will. God is not the puppet master. God is not the person who tells us everything to do. God is, is, 
you know, we seek to follow, we, we listen, I do anyway, and I try to do what God wants me to do, and sometimes that's not always so clear. But I still struggle with that. So I came to a place where this is, you know, I'm growing. I'm be, I am being transformed through this scripture my whole life. So after I put my fit, foot on the brake about that, and then I thought about free will, I kind of put my foot back on the gas again and said, okay, I can, I can live with this. And then I, I remember having to do a theology of the cross in seminary, and everybody's this different. This is just mine. But it came to, it occurred to me, God sent Jesus indeed to save the world, to bring health and wholeness and healing, to save from danger. God sent Jesus to tell the truth, even the uncomfortable truth. And it made a lot of people mad. The Romans did not like people stirring up prob- trouble. They wanted to rule Jerusalem. They wanted to keep everything peaceful. And they had an agreement with the Sanhedrin and the, 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 the leaders of the Jewish people. We're going to keep every, got everybody under control here. Jesus did not get the memo. Jesus came and told the hard truth. Jesus came indeed to save the world. Jesus came to tell about God's love. Jesus came to show that love is more important than the law. Jesus came to tell stories to help people develop a relationship with God, to learn to love God and to trust God rather than to be afraid of God all the time. Jesus came. So indeed... The world would be saved. Those Romans and those Sanhedrin people and those other people that I don't understand, that made them mad. They wanted to get rid of Jesus because he was causing too much trouble. And the Romans were already crucifying people and hanging them on the hill outside of town, people that caused trouble. Somehow or another, Jesus wound up in there and I where I am right now. Now, as I grow in faith, I might know something a little different. But I think Jesus died on that cross because he made people mad, because he told the truth. And maybe it was out of God's free will that that kind of thing happened. Then Tuesday... I put my foot back on the gas. <laughs> We're going to get into this scripture for God so loved the world that God gave God's only son that whoever believed in him would have eternal life. Indeed, God sent Jesus into the world so that we would have eternal life, so that we would experience God's eternal love here and now. This, and if you read the rest of the, the, the chapter of John, this isn't about what happens when we die. It's about it happens what we're living now. For God so loved the world that Jesus came so that you could experience God's eternal love. So that you could experience the eternal now in God's love. Yes, God sent Jesus to save the world from the dangers, from the heartache, from the difficulties that we experience. God sent Jesus with a word of hope that says wherever we find ourselves in in the midst of despair and troubled times, in whatever we're going through, that this is not the end. Hope always says this is not the end. God's eternal love flows through us and in us and around us and about us here and now this very day. What 
what I love about, and my foot's on the gas on this one, what I love about this scripture, about God's eternal love, is that when we go through difficult times in life, and gosh, we've all made mistakes. I'm not going to tell you all mine because I might not get to stay. But we go through those times and we go through periods of life. And somehow or another, God renews us and brings us to a new place. God revives us. God saves us. God gives us a new lease on life. And to me right now, that's more important than what happens when I die. I served as associate pastor at my first appointment out of seminary. I was in Lawton, Oklahoma, and the senior pastor was about my age, but he'd gone to seminary long before I did. And we were doing a funeral together. And there was a woman who had lived apparently in Lawton a few years ago, her daughter lived in Texas. We didn't know the woman. We didn't even know she existed. But when they asked us to do her funeral, of course we did it. And we found out as much about this woman as we could, and we, tried, and we celebrated her life the best we could. And we went to the cemetery, and we did what we did there, and we came back. And a few people in the church remember the, the woman, but most didn't. But they didn't care. They, they prepared a feast to celebrate this woman's life and to feed her daughter on a difficult day. And I remember, I'll never forget this moment, the daughter, who was a veterinarian in Texas, walked up to Chuck, my senior pastor, and said, do you think Mama went to heaven? Man, I was taking notes, because I didn't know what sure how I would answer that, because I didn't know the woman. And Chuck said so eloquently, I don't know, that's not my call. And that was such a healing experience for me, especially having had washed, after having washed my dog clothes and having the, the voice call my name and all the sinful things I had done to realize that the Jesus who came into the world to love us and to save us might have more to do with that than anybody else. What we learned in Bible study this week was about this Jesus who came to save the world wants us to have a relationship, wants us to trust in Jesus wants us to grow in that trust, and that's what I've been doing with this scripture all my life. I did not trust it the first time I heard it. I did not trust a whole lot in Jesus the first time I heard about Jesus. But through the church and through people like you and through my relationship with God, that has changed over the years. And so I'm hearing in this scripture that we are to trust in Jesus who did come to save us and to bring us eternal life every moment of our lives, who came to breathe life into us and help us to be the people that God created us to be. My foot's on the gas with that one. I have to return to that story where I was curled up on the bed after I'd heard that voice call my name. It was 25 years later or so when I was a seminary student that I realized that that voice calling my name was not the devil with a pitchfork, but it was God calling me into ministry. It took me a good 25 years to figure all that out. It took me, it took me some recovery from all of, uh, all of those experiences of my childhood to realize, yes, God was calling my name. And it is through the love and the eternal life that we hear in this scripture and through the trust we develop in Jesus and the relationship we develop that we are all called 
by God into some sort of ministry, whether it be feeding people, whether it be preparing, preparing for Sunday morning, whether it be giving to the food pantry, whether it, whatever it is, preparing Bible school, welcoming younger people into our church, feeding the FCA, whatever it is, God is call, God's, got it, God's calling each one of us. I was just fortunate enough to actually hear that voice. Sometimes it's the still, small voice. But the scripture has transformed me through the years to be a person who is more trusting of Jesus, to understand that Jesus really did come to bring love to the world, an eternal love that flows in and through us and around us and who knows what eternal love we are extending to others. For God so loved the world that God sent a son that we might be saved for the work of love. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, you transform us all in different ways. We all have different understandings of our relationship with you, and they're all good. We all have different words for talking about our love for you and your love for us. We all have different visions of what it means to be your people in the world. We all know that we are called to love you and to love others and to continue to experience the scripture in ways that are meaningful to us. And may we all be found faithful in the spirit of the living Christ. Amen.